Four. All right. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you and to be with you tonight. My name is Brenna Marsicek. I'm the Communications and Outreach Director for Madison Audubon. Here at Madison Audubon, we focus on bird conservation, uh, habitat protection, environmental education, and advocacy. You may have been out to one of our sanctuaries this spring uh, or tuned into one of our online education programs this year. And if so, welcome back. And if not, we're glad that you're here. Welcome. Uh, we're grateful you're here tonight to join us for our first fully online Evenings with Audubon. Our Evenings with Audubon speaker programs are normally held in person. Since that obviously is impossible right now, we thought this would be a good alternative. So here we are. Thanks for being here. Uh, and we are delighted to have Dan Jackson on the horn tonight to share his wealth of knowledge about dragonflies and damselflies. Dan is pretty much the guy for dragonflies and damselfly information in this part of the world. He grew up in Wisconsin, has lived in Wisconsin for a long time. Um, he's really involved with the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society the Cooley Region Audubon Society. He's the record reviewer for the Wisconsin Odonata Survey, bugguide.net, Odonata Central, and eBird. He does all sorts of wildlife surveys. He's a self-proclaimed bug nerd um, and a wildlife photographer. So he gives presentations to groups like ours all the time. And this summer, our Goose Pond Sanctuary staff and volunteers are running a dragonfly and damselfly survey in Columbia County. So I thought this would be a good time for all of us to learn more. So next I'll hand it over to Dan, but first, please be sure if you have any questions throughout his presentation to type them into the comments box at any point. Um, I'll keep an eye on that and we'll get to those questions at the end of his talk. And um, if you have any, so be sure to type them in along the way. Um, with that, Dan, I'll hand it over to you and thank you for being here. Howdy, is that working? That's great. Okay, good evening and thanks for coming everybody. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Dan Jackson. Uh, I'm actually a, a, a citizen scientist. Uh, I, I am not a professional biologist. So, I mean, obviously there are uh, Odonata scientists in Wisconsin that, that I've actually learned from, and I'm going to actually be sharing a lot of the stuff that, that, that they shared with me, uh, just for clarity. Uh, my program tonight is, is about the damsels and dragons of Wisconsin, and basically what I'm going to be talking about are members of the insect order Odonata, uh, which means the toothed ones, um, and that's referring to the fact um, that dragonflies and damselflies are really ferocious predators, both as flying adults, as you see here. Uh, this is a picture that someone posted to the internet a couple of years ago that shows a dragon hunter um, that has actually brought a, a young ruby-throated hummingbird to the ground. Um, he stepped in and saved the hummingbird, but it just shows that these guys are, are willing and able and, and to take on anything up to their own size and sometimes even bigger. Um, and that's also true as nymphs. Um, when they're nymphs under the, and they spend a, a big part of their life underwater um, as nymphs, um, and even there, uh, for their size, they are some of the most ferocious predators uh, that we have in the natural world. Thought I'd start the program tonight by talking a little bit about um, how do dragonflies and damselflies differ? What you know, I think people hear both words. A lot of people don't know what we're talking about, uh, so that that seems like a good place to start. Um, on the slide that I'm showing, uh, the damselfly, an example of a damselfly is in the upper left. That happens to be an American ruby spot. Um, and we have an example of a dragonfly, which is a widow skimmer in the bottom left. Um, how, how are these guys related? Well, basically they're cousins. Um, damselflies and dragonflies are members of two different suborders within the order Odonata. Uh, damselflies are members of the suborder Zygoptera, which means like-sized or like-shaped wings. Um, and you can see what they're referring to with that picture. Um, in this case, we have a damselfly, and if you notice, it's perched with its wings directly over its back. Um, and that's very common. Most of the damselflies that we have in Wisconsin perch like that. And 
when they're like that, you can see that basically they all line up. They're the same size and shape. Um, dragonflies, on the other hand, uh, are members of the insect uh, or the suborder Anisopter, which means different sized or different shaped wings. And they're referring to the to the flying adult that you see there. Um, and on the, the lead wings are, are, are long and thin, and then the back ones are much more bulged and wide. Um, the end result is that for the same body size, proportionally dragonflies have way more wing surface uh, than their cousins, damselflies. Uh, and that actually shows up then in how they go about feeding. Damselflies are gleaners. They typically fly around. They can fly maybe three or four miles an hour. Uh, they're very, you know, they're, they're very acrobatic. You know, they're very good flyers, but they're not very fast. Um, they can catch other flying insects, but they also um, hover right by plants and you'll see them plucking things like aphids right off of, off of a leaf. Uh, dragonflies, on the other hand, are totally aerial predators. Um, basically, they are going to fly and catch and chase down and catch uh, anything and everything that they want to eat. Um, and and uh, t basically, uh, their flight capabilities are so amazing that they can do that with relative ease. Uh, dragonflies have been clocked at speeds up to 30 miles an hour. Uh, they're extremely agile. They can stop, uh, hover, even back up just a little bit. They can change direction literally on a dime. Uh, so they are absolutely spectacular flyers, and that gives them that, that ability uh, to catch their prey with relative ease. Uh, if you notice, if you take a look, you'll also see that damselflies are proportionally much more frail looking, uh, much more slender. Uh, and that's a huge difference between the two. If you just see an example of each, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a very obvious thing that you'll notice when you're out in the field. Uh, another, another big point to notice, um, and if you look at that little inset picture on the right, uh, dragonfly, damselflies have eyes that are widely separated. They're way out on the ends of almost a, a head that's a lot like a hammerhead shark. It, uh, the head runs perpendicular to the main axis of the body, and the eyes are way out on the tips and widely separated. Uh, dragonflies, on the other hand, have heads that are more round helmet shaped, um, and, often, and, for, and most of the species have uh, their eyes touching right in the middle or, and covering uh, the majority of, of their head. Um, so basically those are, you know, the, the differences and, and, and the similarities. Uh, like I said, very close cousins, members of two different suborders, uh, uh, very capable flyers and, sorry, just had something speak up in the background. Uh, Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the is the Odonata life cycle. Uh, just a second. Joanne, can you shut that thing down? Alexa, stop. Sorry about that. I apologize. I, I think Alexa, we have an Alexa downstairs and it heard my voice and it decided that I was talking to it. So anyway, I got a little flustered. I do that. Uh, I hope you, you understand. Uh, so anyway, the next section of the presentation I thought what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the, the, the life cycle of Odonata. And the first thing that's really important to understand is that uh, in their life cycle, they have three stages, the egg, the nymph, and the flying adult. Um, and if you compare that to butterflies, which a lot of people are familiar with, uh, butterflies actually have four. They have an egg, a nymph, a pupa stage where they go through a complete metamorphosis, and then a flying adult stage. And if you notice, the big difference here is there's no pupa stage with Odonata. Basically, they transform from an underwater nymph directly to a flying adult without going through a pupa. And we'll talk about that when we get there. So the first part of the stage uh, is the egg. Uh, eggs are most often laid right in the water. The females will deposit them in plants in the water, um, just whack their, their, the tips of their abdomen on the water so that they wash off and fall into the, into the water column. Um, or, other, or in some cases, they'll actually lay them close by, either in the mud above it uh, to, to be prepared for a spring flooding event, and sometimes in plant tissues that are above the water that will then fall into the water over, 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 over a winter, typically. Um, those eggs, uh, some of them hatch immediately or, or you know, within, within a couple days. 
Um, others will actually overwinter uh, and the larva will start to develop the following spring. So those, that's a little bit about the eggs. Uh, here's an example of just showing you how small the eggs are. Uh, this picture is a picture of a female uh, prince basket tail. And if you look uh, down here on the tip of her abdomen, uh, you have a big mass of, of eggs. And what she's doing at the moment is she, she was exuding those eggs in preparation for ovipositing. And once she built up a ball, uh, which, you know, this was about as big as it got, then she took off. And if, if when I watched her, she flew out over the water and she literally almost like skipping stones would tap the tip of her abdomen as she flew. And then that washed off a few of those eggs. And like I said, then they would fall into the, you know, down to attach to plants or rocks or something under the surface of the water. So that's the first stage. Uh, the next stage is the nymph. Um, the nymphs, the nymph is an, is an extremely important stage for the dragonflies and it really determines where you are going to find different species. And that's because the nymph itself has different requirements. Some of them require highly oxygenated water. Um, some are willing to, you know, to develop in very stagnant water, bogs, fens, things like that. Um, other ones uh, will only do well if there aren't any fish. So they need to be in a fishless pond or something like that. Uh, so basically the, the, where the, the dragonfly lays its eggs are very important in terms of whether those nymphs will actually survive to the point where they emerge as a flying adult eventually. Uh, the nymph <clears throat> is, is absolutely the longest part of, of a dragonfly life cycle or damselfly's life cycle. Uh, basically when we're seeing the flying adult, we're only seeing them for a small part of their total lifespan. Um, with some nymphs, uh, they can develop in as little, they can go through and, and develop in as little as six to eight weeks. Um, other, others take literally take years with some species having multi-year nymphs, uh, you know, that, that need multiple seasons to, to grow enough to be ready to, to, to emerge as a flying adult. Uh, the longest that I've heard about are dra is a species called a dragon hunter in very northern um, areas like boreal for the boreal forest area. Um, and in some cases, they've documented that those can nymphs can take up to eight years to grow enough to be ready to emerge, you know, and have the flying adult take, you know, take off. <clears throat> Just like in the flying adults, uh, the nymphs also look very different between the two suborders. Um, and just like with the adults, um, the dramsofly nymph is a much more fragile, you know, frail looking, uh, you know, animal. Um, here you're seeing an example. You can see that it has legs like, like it's the adult. It has the, the head with its eyes way out on the end. It has a thorax with, with wing buds here. Uh, and then the ab a 10 part, a 10 segmented ab abdomen, just like the adult will. The big difference is it also has those three feather like gills on the end. Uh, even as, like I said, in this case, the damselfly, you know, damselfly nymph, even though it's much more frail than its cousin, the, the, the dragonfly nymph, um, is still a very ferocious predator. Here is an example of a, a dragonfly nymph. Um, and as you can see, way more stocky, much more similar to, you know, to, you know, like I said, to the flying adult. Once again, you can see three body parts. You've got the head with the eyes, uh, a thorax with legs, and, and you can see wing buds that will eventually become the wings in the flying adult. Uh, and then you have the abdomen. And one of the things you'll notice is there's no gills here. And that's because the gills of a dragonfly nymph are actually inside of its abdomen. So it sucks water in and out of its rectum, and then the gills transfer the oxygen, um, you know, in, into a circulatory system, you know, as, as to, to, to run its body. One of the huge uh, advantages of that for dragonfly nymphs is because they suck water in and out, they can also shoot it out and use that as a propulsion system. So it helps them chase down prey, and it helps them also to, to evade predators. Um, dragonfly nymphs and damselfly nymphs uh, have a hard exoskeleton, just like uh, just like a flying adult. 
Uh, and because of that, they actually have to molt their skin uh, 10 to 12 times over the course of, the, of their development in order to grow big enough uh, to be ready to emerge. Um, we call the, the periods between those molts instars. Um, and <clears throat> basically, like I said, it takes 10 to 12 instars to, 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 to grow to the terminal length you know, and size that it needs to, to be ready to emerge. And literally that, like I said, can take anywhere from six to eight weeks to eight years. Once the, the nymph is, is ready um, and it's reached its terminal size, um, it's ready to emerge. Um, and then it's going to, be, it's, it's going to be ready to become a flying adult. Um, we, and we, like I said, literally call that emergence. Uh, this is uh, the metamorphosis that happens to prepare for that actually happened within its nymphal skin in that final instar. Uh, and basically within that final nymphal skin is the complete you know, flying adult that it's going to become. Uh, some dragonfly and damselfly nymphs emerge over an extended period of time. Um, there's a, a, a very common species of damselfly that we have in Wisconsin that literally is the first damselfly that I see in the spring and the last that I see in the fall. Um, those basically are opportunists. Whenever the whenever the the the, the nymph grows to the size it needs, it will, it will emerge. Um, other species uh, have mass emergences, and especially uh, the species that you see flying very early in the spring um, often have synchronized emergences where all of the nymphs of that species that will emerge that year will emerge over a very short period of time. And what you'll see then is huge clouds of, 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 this, of that one species uh, at that location or in those areas for a short period of time until they're done flying. Um, and then you won't see them again until the following year. Uh, for species like that, that do those mass emergence, um, the nymphs uh, we feel uh, basically emerge based on a, usually emerge based on a certain number of degree days where the water reach, reaches and exceeds a certain minimum temperature. And so say that 60 degrees, uh, once it hits 60, the kind of the clock starts ticking. And if it needs 100 degree days, if the, if the very first day it's 62 degrees, well, that's two degree days. If it's 68, that's eight more. And when that accumulation comes up to that 100 threshold, for example, that's the key for all, the, the clue or the key that, you know, and that drives all of, of, the, of those nymphs then to, to start to emerge. When they do emerge, uh, basically what you'll do, what they'll do is you'll, they will climb out. Typically, most of them will climb out of the water and grab hold uh, of something, whether that's a rock or in this case, a leaf. Um, in this picture up in the upper left, you can see a nymph that has just finished crawling out. And when it's ready, it just really latches on tight. Uh, in the next picture, you can see that it is actually starting to emerge. What it does that at that point is that literally starts sucking in air and effectively blowing itself up. And then it does something kind of comparable uh, to, to the Hulk. Basically, it literally splits the skin down the back of its thorax. Um, and I don't know if you can see my pointer, but right here uh, behind the head, you can kind of see a little light gray um, piece there. That's actually its thorax starting of, of, the, of, the, of the adult pushing through that nymphal skin. The next, in the next picture, the upper right picture, you can see it's actually progressed even farther and the thorax is really coming out. And you can also see a little bit of yellow there on the adult's head starting to poke out. Finally, in the fourth picture, it's most of the, its thorax and its head are most of the way out. And then it does something really strange. It actually literally flips backwards um, and just hangs on by the tip of its abdomen. And, it, and when it does that, it gets its legs out. So in that final picture, you can see it literally hanging there with its legs out of, of, of its nymphal skin. And it will just sit there then for 10 to 15 minutes uh, and wait for those legs to get hard. And once that they're hard enough, uh, because when, it's, when it does first emerge, its whole exoskeleton is really soft and, and just pliable. Once the legs are, are stiff enough to carry its weight, um, then what you'll see is like what you see happened here between the first and the second photo, it literally just flips up, 
grabs hold of the, grabs hold of the of its of its nymphal skin um, with its legs and then pops the rest of its abdomen out. Um, at that point, we have a, we have a, a flying adult, but it's definitely not ready to, to take off and fly. Uh, the first thing it's going to do once it's completely out of that nymphal skin is it needs to blow up its wings or extend them. And what it does is it starts pumping hemoglyph, which is it's the insect blood, uh, into the veins and the wings and literally extends them using hydraulic pressure. Um, and you can see that in the next three pictures where it's going, you know, where they start from just little wrinkled masses getting a little bigger then, then a little bit bigger with, with, with some wrinkles in them, and then finally fully extended. Uh, once the wings are fully extended, then it's ready to start extending its abdomen. And just like kind of those, uh, those funny balloons you, the clowns used to blow and, and make, you know, basically it just blows that up until it ex extended to its full length. Um, and at that point, the dragonfly is fully sized. It has all of the size that it's going to have throughout its, its flying adult, adult life. Um, at that point, uh, we call this one, you know, this, this uh, a fully extended uh, new adult uh, tenoral. <clears throat> and here's an example of a damselfly ten uh, tenoral. It's not quite ready to fly. If you notice, the abdomen is just only as long as its wings. It's going to have to extend that a little bit farther. Um, but you can see that at this stage, um, their body is very creamy looking, very soft. Its wings are opaque and kind of milky. And that's because its exoskeleton at this stage is still really, really soft and pliable. Um, because of that, they're not really ready to fly. They're going to just sit there probably for another half an hour to 40 minutes, waiting for everything to harden up. Uh, and then they'll take their very first flight. Sometimes um, during when they when they emerge, things do go wrong, um, and this is an example of one of those uh, one of those cases. Um, in this case, we have a fully extended body of this red red saddlebags uh, dragonfly, but if you you can see that the wings just something something happened. I, I don't know if it if if uh, the you know the veins pumping the blood exploded, what happened, or if it or if the wings were shoved up against a plant or something and whatever the whatever the deal the wings were not allowed to expand and this dragonfly will never fly when they uh, when they emerge uh, they leave behind uh, that nymphal skin we call that an exuvi um, and those can be really important uh, to the scientific community because we can go and collect those um, and measure how many of those exuvi we find in a, in a specific area um, and really get an idea of exactly what species are being produced at a specific wetland and in what, in what densities. Um, with the right keys and the right equipment, you can absolutely tell uh, what species these, these nymphal skins came from and even the sex of, 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 you know, of, of those skins. So again, at that point, we have a flying adult. Uh, that when they first emerge, we call them a tenoral. And basically, uh, the very first thing they're going to need to do is fly away from water. Um, there's a lot of, of predators. There's a lot of activity going on. There's a lot of territorial action with other adult dragonflies and damselflies there. So what they so they really aren't ready to mate. So they're, what they're going to want to do first is they're going to fly away from water um, and head away to a place where they can can uh, feed and and mature and become sexually mature in preparation to go back to the water uh, to start the next generation. Uh, that very first flight they make is a really dangerous one because at that point there they are not uh, their exoskeleton is still relatively soft, so they don't have the flying capabilities that they're going to have even hours later. Um, in the, even because of that, they are relatively weak flyers, um, and they are basically a favorite food for a lot of things. Um, and in this case, uh, a cannibal. Uh, the, the dragonfly on the on the top, the, the black and yellow one, is an immature midland clubtail, which has caught a tenoral 
Midland Club Tail on its very first flight. And uh, sadly, I feel very responsible for that because I actually flushed uh, that, that tenoral. And as it flew away, I watched this female come in and just grab it and take it. And, and obviously, she's about to have it for lunch. Other things that, that eat them, um, uh, there are a lot of species of birds that love dragonflies and damselflies. Um, when I walk in a local marsh in early June, oftentimes the path is literally glistening with all of the wings of the dragonflies that, that the kingbirds have caught and, 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 and dropped onto, the, onto that path. Uh, so there are, a, you know, and then I, I also have ponds that I go to in the spring that literally will be ringed with flocks of, of cedar waxwings. Cedar waxwings are, are huge predators of, of tenoral dragonflies and damselflies, and they absolutely know when those things are going to merge, and they're there, and they're ready. Um, and those poor dragonflies and damselflies basically have to fly the gauntlet when they make that first flight away from water. When dragonflies be, um, do start flight, you know, uh, like I said earlier, they start off with very soft uh, exoskeletons. They're not dry. Uh, and then over the next couple weeks, um, as they become sexually mature, they often go through quite a metamorphosis in terms of color uh, and, and, uh, and other changes before they're ready to, you know, become sexually mature and ready to mate. Um, here's one of those examples of one species. This happens to be a Midland clubtail. This is a tenoral that literally is ready to take its first flight. So I, I believe that the, when I took this picture that the, the, the exuvi was right nearby. Um, so you can see that the wings are very shiny and soft and milky looking. The, 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 and the same thing for the, the body. It's not, it, you know, the colors aren't very vibrant. Uh, they're very soft looking. Um, so this is a, uh, a tenoral dragonfly literally within an hour of, of, of first emerging. Here is the same species, another male, uh, one or two days later. So as you can see at this point, um, its exoskeleton has fully dried and hardened, and now you're seeing the vibrant colors uh, that, that the immature Midland Clubtail you know, has uh, with these bright yellows and the black. One of the things you'll notice is that its eyes are still very opaque and milky. Uh, and that's one of the ways to tell with a lot of species to tell that you're looking at an immature rather than a, a mature adult. And then here is that same species in about another two weeks. Now it's completely metamorphosized. It's changed to a light green color. Um, and that's a signal then that this one is sexually mature and is ready to head back to water uh, to look for a mate. Another example. Uh, this is a dragonfly called a widow skimmer, and this is a tenoral male, and I can tell it's a tenoral again because of these really shiny wings um, and real soft and, and just sh overall shine to all of its body. So this one probably emerged uh, because it's, it's a little darker, maybe a, a, an hour or two earlier before I took this picture. Here's the same species after perhaps about a week. Um, what you're starting to see out here on the wings are some white patches, and we call that prunosity. Basically, it's building up a coat of well, very wax-like material out there, um, and it develops in very specific places depending on the species, and it's part of the mature animal's adult mature coloration. So this one is basically halfway to becoming sexually mature. And then finally, here is a very mature adult male. Um, in which case you can see those very bright white patches on the outside of the wings. And then also notice that the, that the abdomen is now covered in a, in a layer of prunosity as well. It's got that a wax-like coating on it uh, that has totally changed it from, and you no longer see the two yellow stripes um, that you saw early, you know, earlier in, in, its, in its life. Okay, at that point, um, We've, we've kind of described the process of how they emerge, how they, they, they change after, you know, after they start to fly, uh, and, and how they go away from water to become sexually mature. Um, once they are sexually mature, they're going to start heading back to water and looking for the appropriate 
uh, water habitats that their species need for their nymphs. Um, so basically, it's time to mate. In many cases, uh, with dragonflies and damselflies, uh, the males will head back to water first. Um, and what they're going to do is they will find what they think is the appropriate, nymphal, the best nymphal habitat, and they will actually fight over that, you know, what they, what they see as the best possible territories with the best possible habitat for nymphs. Uh, and then they will ward off all the all the other males to try to, to maintain that prop, to maintain that space. Um, when the females then are mature and ready to mate and, and to lay eggs, they will fly in and select the, the, the habit that the territory that they like best and fly into that territory. Uh, when they do that, the male is going to grab her um, from behind and um, and what he will do is, Reach, for, reach forward then with the tip of his abdomen and the tip of the abdomen will grab the back of her head. Um, and then they will fly in this position. It's called flying in tandem. Um, and if she's ready to mate, uh, she will then swing the tip of her abdomen forward and connect so that they can, so that like this. And we call, so uh, when they first connect, we call this flying in tandem. And then when they are actually ready, uh, ready to, to, to go through the mating process, we call them in wheel because, uh, because it kind of creates kind of a wheel-like structure. Um, and at this point, uh, uh, there's a sperm transfer. The, tran the, the male will transfer sperm, which will fertilize the eggs. And then once those eggs are fertilized, uh, the female will be, will be ready to start laying eggs. So this is what a pair of dragonflies look like when they're in the wheel. And this is what a pair of damselflies looks like when it's in the wheel. Damselflies, because of their long, thin bodies, end up creating a shape that, that's very heart-shaped, um, and in some cases, almost perfectly heart-shaped, which is, which is uh, seems quite, I guess, quite appropriate. Once the actual mating act, the act of mating and, and sperm transfer is done, the females are then ready to start laying eggs. Um, and many, the different species have a lot of different techniques that they use to go about that. Sometimes the females do it on their own. Other times they do it in tandem, like you're seeing here with this pair of, of common green darners. Uh, other times they will, they will let go, the, the male will let go, but stay, stay nearby to protect the female. Uh, basically, in many cases, the females are going to do some, do, try to prevent other males from, from getting hold of the female and, and and, and mating with her again, because typically if that happens, one of the first thing he's going to do is remove the sperm that was deposited earlier uh, and replace it with his own. Uh, one of the ways to prevent that is, is to stay connected like you're seeing here. So we're, this is tandem ovipositing. And if you look at the very tip of the abdomen, you can see a little itty bitty black, uh, almost look like a little spike coming down. And that is, oops, I'm sorry. That's the female's ovipositor, and she's actually uh, depositing eggs in that piece of grass under the water. Here is another dragon, a different dragonfly species that's doing something different. Um, in this case, the male is not connected. So the female is actually flying by herself, laying eggs. But what you don't see is about two feet up, straight up above her, the male is hovering right up there. And if another male comes over and tries to get close to her, he will attack it and chase it away. And we call that hover guarding. And what she's doing is she's simply tapping the tip of her abdomen in the water so that the eggs will drop down and attach to that mass of weeds that's right under the water. Damselflies often uh, stay connected when, when, when ovipositing. And, and it, so, it, and, and that will also, you know, the, the advantage there is it keeps other males from mating with the female. And in this case, you're seeing a male, a pair that's, a, that's attached. And the female is once again, using an ovipositor to insert eggs into that stick that's in the water. Here's another twist on that. This is a pair of, of amber, wings, amber winged, spread winged damselflies. Um, and if you notice all of these holes down of this stalk of grass, 
the female is actually has a, a very sharp ovipositor on the tip of her, on, you know, down on the tip of her abdomen, and she's drilling, a, basically drilling a hole into that stalk and then depositing the egg. Um, in this case, it serves a really interesting purpose. These eggs aren't going to hatch until the following spring. So by drilling them into that plant material, um, they're, they're protected there from, from predation. Uh, and then when, uh, when it becomes fall and winter, that piece of grass is going to fall down into the water. Uh, and then it will be in the water next spring when it's time, when it's time for, that, for that nymph to, to, uh, to hatch and, and, and start the process all over again. So basically, I just talked about um, the dragonfly and damselfly life cycle. Um, and I thought the next thing to do would be to talk just a little bit about all of the different species uh, uh, that we are, not all of them, we don't have that kind of time, but some representative uh, species of, the, of, of both groups to, to show you what they're like. But before we do that, just a little bit of, you know, just a little bit of numbers. Um, I'm sure a lot of people don't recognize that there's a tremendous amount of, of Odonata diversity right here in Wisconsin. In fact, we have 165 species uh, that have been discovered to date in our state. Um, that includes 48 damselflies uh, made up of representatives of three different families. And we also have 117 different species of dragonflies that represent six different families. And at this point, I'll show you some examples of those families. Uh, I thought I'd start with, with damselflies, um, just, I, just because, I guess. Uh, so damselflies, we have three families. We have what are called the broad-winged damsels, uh, the pond damselflies, and the spread-winged damselflies. Broad-winged damselflies are probably the most colorful and most gorgeous damselflies. Uh, I guess it, it, it's a personal preference, but um, these are the damselflies that are the most brightly colored. Uh, two of the three species that we have here have brilliant emerald green bodies um, with either all black or partially black wings. Um, the other one is, is metallic red with some red, or, uh, with the other two are, are metallic red bodies with some red in the wings. So very colorful damselflies. Um, all four species that we have here in Wisconsin um, are, are, are very, uh, they prefer highly oxygenated water. So you're gonna find them at, you know, things like trout streams, uh, especially close to riffles, waterfalls, places like that. So these are not dragonfly or damselflies that you'll typically find um, at a pond situation unless there's a, a, a you know, a, a stream or something with actively moving water very close by. I showed, I have a couple different examples uh, of this, of members of this family. Um, this one is called the River Jewel Wing. Uh, gore, again, gorgeous green, emerald green metallic body uh, with tinted wings with black tips. Um, it has a cousin called the Ebony Jewel Wing that has solid black wings instead. And then uh, we also have two species of ruby spots in the state, and the most widespread is this one. Um, it's called the American Ruby Spot. This happens to be a female. Uh, but again, very gorgeous uh, metallic green body in this case, a lot of red and other colors in the wings. So again, these are extremely colorful um, and, and, and gorgeous damselflies. The next family I thought I'd talk about is the biggest family of damsels. This is the, are the pond damselflies. And, and it's, it actually has, oh, right off the top of my head, probably six different genuses, six or seven uh, within. So it's, it's, uh, the, of the 48 species of damselflies in the state, I think over about 30, 32, 33 of them are pond damsels. And so there's a lot of diversity um, and, and uh, a lot of variation. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of, some of them are extremely similar uh, in terms of appearance and sometimes can be very difficult uh, to identify just by sight. Pond damsels have real narrow perfectly clear wings always. Um, most of the species of pond damsels that we have in Wisconsin are, are associated with still or slow moving water. Um, there are several species though that do, uh, that do prefer more oxygenated moving water. So, so it, the, the still water situation is not, you know, not 100%. Some examples 
Um, this one is called a variable dancer. Um, it's, it's called that because it actually different, has different color morphs throughout its range. It's pretty widespread over the eastern half of the United States. Um, we're lucky to have the violet version of it in our state, which is just an absolutely gorgeous little damselfly. So this is a male variable dancer. Uh, these guys are, are, can be found at both still and moving water situations. Um, varies from county to county about how prevalent they are. Uh, but you have quite a few of them down uh, in the southeast corner of the state. Uh, there, are, there are a couple locations in, in Dane County, I know, uh, but especially if you get closer to Milwaukee, Waukesha County and stuff like that, they're very common on some of the smaller rivers and streams there. <clears throat> There's a whole group of pond damsels uh, that, that are the genus Analagma. Uh, that are the bluets. And most of, of the, the, the species in that genus that we have here in Wisconsin are black and blue. But the amount of blue varies. And there are kind of three main groups um, with what we call blue bluets, where the abdomen is more blue than black. And if you look at the front of the abdomen here, you know, those segments of the abdomen are, are mostly blue with a little bit of black. Um, this one happens to be a, a Hoggins bluet, uh, which is pretty, very common throughout Wisconsin. Uh, a fairly early flyer, May and June, uh, with, with some of them extending all the way into August. Then we have a group um, called the intermediate bluets that are about half black and half blue or, or close. Um, and one of a, a, this species, the tule bluet, is an extremely widespread example of that. And, and they're found pretty much all the way throughout the, uh, our entire state and are very common. And they're a relatively late flyer. So these guys are, are flying right now. And then we have black bluets. Um, and you can see, you know, in this case, we have uh, an animal where the abdomen is mostly black, almost entirely black in this case. Uh, this one happens to be a pond specialist, and it's called a skimming bluet. Not all bluets are blue. Some of them are orange. Um, some of them, like this one, are yellow and blue. Um, this one is, is called a vesper bluet. It gets its name because it only comes out right at dusk. Uh, it's, it's, it's an absolutely gorgeous little damselfly, but it's really hard to see because they typically only come out about a half an hour before sunset. Um, so, you know, frankly, I, it took me 10 years to get this picture because they're that hard to find when they're, when they're not out, you know, about the only time they're easy to see is it in the evening out flying over the water. Uh, but during the day, they hide under the leaves and in, the, in bushes and places like that. So um, I was really excited to get this picture last fall. The most common damselfly that we have in Wisconsin uh, is this little guy. It's called an eastern forktail. This is literally the very first damselfly I see in the spring and the last one that I'm going to see in the fall. Um, normally, they start flying probably around the 1st of May. Um, there was, in 2012, we had an extremely warm year, and I saw my first newly emerged eastern forktail on April 2nd. Uh, for comparison, this year was a relatively cold spring, and the first one I saw was on May 20th, basically eight weeks later than 2012. So weather plays a really key role in when dragonflies and damselflies uh, first start to, we first start to see them each year. Okay, so those are the two groups. Uh, the, the last group of damselflies, the last family are the spread wings. These are the largest damselflies in the state. Um, and they get their name from the fact that they, when they perch, they hold their wings at about a 45 degree angle. All the rest of them perch with their wings directly over the back but these ones are spread a little bit. Here's uh, the, the longest damselfly that we have in Wisconsin. This is the slender spread wing. Um, and you can see just, and this one is basically about two inches long, which is really long for a damselfly. Another example, this one's a female emerald spread wing. And you can see where she gets that name from that beautiful emerald uh, exoskeleton. Okay, 
then we'll, we'll switch to dragonflies. With dragonflies, um, we have six different families of dragonflies that we have here in Wisconsin. There are actually seven found in North America, but one of them does not occur here, and that is the petaluridae, uh, the petal tails. Uh, but we do have darners, club tails, spike tails, cruisers, emeralds, and skimmers. Darners um, are some of the most uh, are some of the largest and most powerful flyers in the in our drag in, in amongst our dragonflies, um, and are some of the ones that people tend to see the most. Um, one of the key features of these is their they, you know, their head is almost entirely made up of eyes and mouth parts, uh, and you can see just how huge those eyes are, and they meet at a seam down the center of the face, and just. That, that eye structure is really important for these guys because they are absolutely spectacular aerial you know, carnivores. Um, in this case, they have eyes that contain up to 30,000 eyelets. Um, and it's believed that they can literally see in 12 or 13 different wavelengths of color. We see in three. So they see ultraviolet light and other things that we have no idea what, what they might look like. Um, and all, and so they are definitely a sight-based hunter, um, and these huge eye structures give them that capability. Here's one example of that of a darner. Um, this one is probably the one everybody has seen. Um, this is a common green darner. This species is actually a migrant, um, and so therefore it will be absolutely the very first dragonfly that I see every spring. Um, and when I see them, what I'm actually seeing are dragonflies that emerged um, way down south along the Gulf Coast, and they have flown a thousand miles up here uh, to get ready to lay their eggs. Once they arrive, they lay eggs in our ponds. Um, their, their nymphs hatch immediately, um, and they grow really fast, and they'll be ready to emerge in eight to ten weeks, and they are emerging right now, and then that generation will turn around and fly south. Um, so in about, in the next few weeks, oftentimes if you're out near a field, you may see huge swarms of dragonflies. And most likely you're seeing huge clouds of this species, the common green darter. We also have a whole bunch of, uh, we have several other groups, but uh, uh, four, other, uh, some, four, other, four or five other genuses. The most common of those genuses are the Asian darners, the mosaic darners. Uh, which are beautiful chocolate brown darners with blue with blue markings and different stripes. Uh, we identify them by looking at those stripes on the thorax. Um, in this case, we're looking at what, what's known as a lance-tipped darner. The, other, the next family of dragonflies that I'd like to sh share are the club tails. Um, and you can see in that top picture exactly how they get their name. Basically, the tip of their abdomen in many of the species is widened and, and, and looks kind of like a club. Um, in this case, this is a cobra club tail, so it's one of the most, ex, you know, the, the widest example, proportionally biggest club. Uh, uh, you know, there's only one that's bigger in Wisconsin. Um, one of the key features of this, of members of this of this family, are that their eyes do not touch. They're separated, not as far as a damselfly, but they don't touch. And they have this, what's called an occiput, this little ridge between the eyes. Couple examples. This is a, a full body version of the, the two pictures that you just saw. This is that cobra club tail, uh, just a, a real you know, neat looking animal. Um, these guys, uh, lay their eggs and their nymphs grow in, in, in moving water, streams, rivers. Uh, this one, this picture was taken on the bank of the Mississippi near Genoa. Another example, this is a different genus. This is a, one of the Stylurus club tails. This is called a russet tipped club tail. Um, this is a, a species uh, that's, a, that's a relatively late flyer. They don't start flying until about the 1st of July um, and they fly all the way into September and sometimes into October. Um, in Wisconsin, we find these on the really large rivers, the Wisconsin, um, the Mississippi, and some, of their, um, and some of their tributaries. Another neat group that we have here are, are the spike tails. Um, if, if the, these guys, again, have eyes that, that, in this case, barely touch. They meet right at the middle in little points that come together right at the very tip. 
And that's one of the ways, just by looking at that face, that you can tell immediately that you have a, a, a spike tail. Um, they are basically a dark chocolate brown to black with bright yellow markings. Um, and we have three species in the state and all of them are associated with very small clean streams or, or seeps. So uh, very, very interesting microhabitat uh, that's unique to that, that, that this group really prefers. Uh, this one is the arrowhead spike tail and to me is one of the most spectacular dragonflies in the state. Uh, those gorgeous air, you know, you can see how it gets its name with those, those yellow arrowhead markings down the top of its abdomen. Uh, but it's just huge wings, a long body, uh, one of the, the longest dra dragonflies that we have in Wisconsin at, at very close to three inches long. Here's a different species. This is a twin spotted and, and you can see how the spike tails get their name by, by that. It's that, that this is a female and she's got a very long ovipositor that extends beyond the tip of her abdomen. And that's the spike that they're referring to in spike tail. And they use that to insert her eggs in mud on the edges of streams. Next group are the cruisers. Uh, these again are some really big dragonflies, um, typically found on medium to large streams and rivers. One of the, the, the most important uh, ca characteristic of these is they only have a single bright stripe on the side of the thorax. Most others have at least two. Um, so if you see something, uh, you know, one of the, with only one, you automatically know that they that you're looking at a cruiser. They also have typically have bright lines across the face. We have a, a couple examples that I wanted to share. Uh, this one is called the Swift River Cruiser, basically a beautiful chocolate brown uh, cruiser with, with yellow spots and absolutely gorgeous emerald green eyes. And then this one is the stream cruiser, very different looking with brown instead of, you know, light brown uh, and white spots. Uh, but again, a real pretty dragonfly that you'll find on small streams and, and, and rivers, uh, typically in the northern half of the state. Second to last family are our emeralds. Um, emeralds are, there are a few genuses and they range from some of the most common to some of the most rare species that we have in Wisconsin. Um, they get their name because the males typically have bright emerald green eyes like you see in that upper in the, in the picture in the upper right. Um, and, I, and I've got a couple examples I wanted to show you. This one has its it, it has the name the common basket tail and it definitely lives up to its name. This is probably when it's flying is probably the most common dragonfly on the landscape. Uh, this is a species that does that mass emergence, like I was talking about quite a while ago, um, where all of the nymphs emerge over the course of a two-day period. And when they do that, these guys just spread out into the landscape around their, their, natal, their natal wetlands. Um, and you can see swarms of, of 50, 100, and sometimes you can see 25 of them on a single branch. Um, so they're, they're, you know, they can be present in just amazingly huge numbers. Uh, this one is a, 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 an adult mature male. So he's got, in this case, not bright green eyes, but, but kind of blue green eyes. Uh, but again, a very striking and really gorgeous uh, little dragonfly. On the other end of the spectrum, this is the rarest dragonfly in North America. Uh, and we have them right here in a few different locations in Wisconsin. Uh, this one is the Heinz Emerald. Uh, and it literally is the only federally endangered dragonfly that we have. Uh, uh, very, very obviously, very highly protected by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because, and it's very much limited because its nymphal habitat is really, really specific. Um, it needs, you know, kind of cool water that's flowing through the ground, often associated with a limestone substrate, uh, kind of sheet water that's moving, that's cool, that's that's clean, but but you know, and and then it's also the nymphs are specifically associated with a single species of crayfish. And they, they, when we believe that they share the crayfish burrows and actually overwinter in those crayfish burrows. Um, so again, a, a, just a, a really cool, but very, very rare dragonfly that we're lucky enough to have right here in Wisconsin. Finally, um, probably the group of dragonflies that we see the most and are, are the most obvious 
Uh, these are the skimmers. Most of these are associated with still and, and, and slow moving water. Um, and they're usually the most colorful dragonflies that we have on the landscape. Uh, probably my favorite example is this one. Um, it's called a Halloween pennant. And this happens to be a female, so she's yellow and black, but males are orange and black. So again, just a really, really gorgeous little dragonfly um, associated with ponds and, and wetlands like that. Another very common one at ponds and still waters is the 12 spotted skimmer. Um, it gets that name from the 12 black spots. Uh, this one is a male, so he also has white spots as well and with maturity and has also developed a prunose covering on his, on his abdomen, which has turned that into a kind of a powder blue as well. And then finally, the very last dragonfly that we'll see every year, each year, uh, is this one. This one is aptly called the Autumn Meadowhawk. Uh, it's just a little itty bitty red dragonfly, about just about an inch and a quarter long. Um, they are flying right now. They started to emerge about a month ago. Um, has these light yellow legs, very clear wings, and just kind of, you know, with maturity, the male just turns a bright red like this. Uh, and just, but they can literally fly uh, when it's 40 or 50 degrees. You know, if they can find a little sunny spot, a microhabitat that can keep warm enough, um, they can fly all the way into November. Just some ideas if you're interested, how do I learn to identify them? Well, luckily there are a lot of field guides. Um, a couple Odonata biologists got together, a group of them got together several years ago or 15 years ago and understood that up until that point, dragonflies were only known by a scientific names and that's not something that most people were interested in. Um, and so they sat down and they literally named all of the dragonflies that we find in North America. And ever since then, the field guides have been referring to them by that, and it's made them a lot more approachable to, to people like you and I who aren't, you know, more scientific. And, you know, so great field guides are important. Uh, there are a lot of great internet discussion groups and websites. Um, the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society, which I'll talk about in a second, has a, a Facebook group right here in Wisconsin where you can share photos. Um, but there's other ones as well. So the internet is a great place, obviously, in this day and age for researching, de researching these neat animals. And then finally, if you, you know, there are people who are very willing, like myself, who are very willing to share and, and help out. And so if you have pictures, um, you know, if you, know, you can send them to us, we'll help you to try to identify the, the species that you found. Most importantly, try it, get out there, swing a net, catch some, take pictures of them, whatever you're comfortable with in, but, but at least enjoy uh, these wonderful, these wonderful animals that, that, we, that we find right here in our state. Here are some of the great field guides that we have today. Um, for Wisconsin, for dragonflies, these top, th the top three, um, the one on the right side, the dragonflies of Wisconsin was written by Carl Legler. Uh, it's available through the UW Arboretum bookstore. Um, it's a great one, a great starting guide because it has all of the dragonflies, which are the easiest to, to because they're so big and so recognizable, uh, a great place to start. It has all the species. It has the range in Wisconsin. It has flight periods, everything and things like that. Um, the other two are also spectacular with the one on the left um, covering the entire eastern half of the continent. So it's quite a bit bigger. And then for damselflies, the two books on the bottom are, are, are spectacular resources as well. Um, Internet-wise, uh, the Wisconsin Odonata Survey, if you're interested in, in taking part, uh, we're always looking for, pe for people to help. Uh, it's a great citizen science project. If you can get out there and learn your dragonflies, you can make that count by submitting your sightings. Uh, and actually having the, have those site, sightings become available to the scientific community to understand the distribution and populations uh, of, of, of Wisconsin's dragonflies and damselflies. Odonata Central also has a survey on, on, a, on a hemispheric basis. It accepts sightings from both North, South, and Central America. Uh, so it covers the entire Western Hemisphere. Um, 
we have a Wisconsin Dragonfly Society, which is a great little organization aimed at fostering, uh, getting people interested and, and, and taking part in learning about dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, we have a website. There's lots of great information there. And then, of course, for any type of insect, if you find something that you can't identify, um, I would strongly urge you to submit it to Bug Guide. Um, and I swear there's a group of entomologists that just sit there and watch for new submissions to come in and see how fast they can answer you know, the question. I've literally had bugs identified that I've sent to the Bug Guide within five minutes in some cases. It's, it's, it's almost crazy. Uh, I was asked to to remind uh, to once again remind everybody that Madison Audubon is actually taking on its own survey, uh, specifically of the ponds right around the Goose Pond area in Columbia County, um, and they are definitely looking for more help. So if you're interested in dragonflies and damselflies, um, they would love to hear from you. Um, and there's a link here, but you can also just go to the Madison Audubon site uh, and do a search, and I'm sure that you can find that. So. Anyway, that's, uh, I, I, I got a little carried away. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm known for that. I apologize uh, if people, if I spent a little too much time. But uh, uh, anyway, obviously, I love these things. I get a little carried away with trying to, to share as much information as I can. But I hope in, uh, that you enjoyed it. And uh, obviously, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Your love definitely shows. So everyone, if you have any questions, be sure to type them in now while we have Dan with us to answer them. Um, Dan, if you don't mind, I'll start with the first questions asked since yeah. they're further up in the feed and then work our way through to the most recent questions. Um, so someone asked, is the emergence process similar to what happens with a butterfly? Very much, but again, like I said, the, one of the big differences between those two orders is that butterflies go through four life stages and have a complete metamorphosis in the pupa. Basically, the when they go into a pupa stage, um, you know, it becomes their their whole body kind of disintegrates, becomes almost like a soup, and then recreates itself as an adult flying adult. Uh, with a dragonfly nymph. Basically, if you look at the nymph, you can recognize the adult in that nymphal skin. So it is actually the flying adult is developing within that nymphal skin throughout its throughout those instars. And so at the last, so it, it's not a complete metamorphosis, but rather just kind of the final stage of, it, of that progression. I don't know. I, hopefully that answered that question. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks. Um, is there any evidence that birds that eat dragonflies are able to detect the timing of the emergences and take advantage of that vulnerability? I, I just think like anything, phenology is definitely something that's built in, you know, whether somehow they know that they, they seem to, they just know because I like literally I will go to a, a pond that I survey regularly and I won't see cedar waxwings earlier in the season. Uh, but then as those mass emergences are ready to happen, all of a sudden they start to show up. And so I don't know what clue they're, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're figuring out, but, but they definitely understand that that's a food source that they want to take advantage of. And they're there when they, when it happens. Mm -hmm. Smart. What is the current status of the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly? I think you touched on this, but maybe just a. Uh, it's, it is definitely still federally endangered. Uh, with, with some effort, uh, we, uh, the scientific community has found quite a few more. Originally, it was only known from a couple locations here in Wisconsin and then in, up, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I believe, is where the, um, that's extended. So for, uh, there are population, known populations in Missouri. Uh, I'm not going to get them all right, but, the, but, but with looking, we have definitely, and uh, Illinois, um, and actually, we, uh, a citizen scientist, somebody who submitted a sighting to our Facebook page this year may have clued us to a whole other population in Wisconsin. Somebody discovered a Heinz Emerald in Columbia County, actually, uh, which is 70 miles away from one known population and about 100 miles away from a different one. So I, I, what's, basically what's happened is, is more and more populations have been discovered. Um, there is a, a rearing 
effort going on where they are rearing nymphs right next to me here in, in Genoa, Wisconsin at the Genoa Fish Hatchery. Um, and so they collect adult females that, that with fertilized eggs, they, they raise the nymph. And then when they're at that final instar stage, just, just getting ready to um, emerge, they've been taking those down to historic rape, um, sites in Illinois and letting them, you know, putting the nymphs in the water in hopes that we can reestablish populations at those historic sites. So there's a lot of different things going on in, with Heinz. That's cool. Uh, what advantage is conveyed by the dragonflies developing prenosity? Yeah, I think it's basically, we, we, everything I've read is, is it's more of a signal of, its, of the sexual maturity. Um, and I'm guessing that it might have, there might be advantages that we don't understand because we don't see in all those wavelengths just like the, the way female birds might select a mate based on the color of their plumage and things like that. You know, there may be clues in that prunosity that we can't even detect that are, 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 are that are, and that, that are being picked up by the females, uh, you know, and, and in for mate selection. And there was a recent, uh, study about something comparable to the red color in, in, a, in a group of a family of dragonflies in uh, Japan that basically indicated that. So I, 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 again, it's more of a guess than anything else, but. Sure, sounds like a good one. Um, another question is, do bats eat dragonflies? That I don't know. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that early flying bats would take, you know, they're, they're spectacular hunters and there are, some species of da dragonflies and damselflies that push the limits of, you know, like I said, I mentioned that Vesper bluet. So they're flying right at dusk. So those obviously, you know, the bats are opportunists. So I would, I would have to believe that they would take advantage of, 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 of them as a food source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, someone, Susan asked, can you suggest a technique for using a net? She said, I don't know how to use it without hurting the dragonflies. <laughs> Kurt Mead has an interesting comment in his book that, that talks about how catching dragonflies should be considered a spectator sport because if you start swinging a net, you look like a fool. <laughs> and it, it's just one of those things where you, it's, it's experience. Um, but if you understand that the dragonfly itself, it helps too. Dragonflies have those huge, dragonflies and damselflies have huge rounded eye structures. And basically they can see about 300 degrees. So about the only place they can't see is directly behind and down behind. So the best thing to do if you can is to swing from below and behind so they don't see that net until the last possible second. Mm -hmm. um, you don't wanna do a long swing because the longer, you know, you, you wanna put your net in a place where you know, when the dragonfly comes by it's going to be really close to that net when you start swinging because they're going to be able to react faster than you can swing. But you need a fast swing um, and you need to keep swinging past the dragonfly. The dragonfly, you need the dragonfly to go all the way back into the tip of the net. And then as you're swinging, you need to twist the net so that the back end of the, the net folds over the rim and actually locks the dragonfly in there. Um, and then if you're going to catch them, um, when you reach in and grab them, first of all, you never want to catch a tenoral because I talked about how soft their, their exoskeleton is and you can really damage their wings and skeleton. So if you, if exoskeleton, so if you think you have a tenoral, just leave it alone. But if you have a mature adult, it's, they can be handled very safely, but you just need to reach into the net, get all four wings straight up above the thorax and grab all four at once, you know, between two fingers. And that's a really nice safe hold because then they can't struggle and you won't break a wing or break a leg or break, you know, or hurt them. And their wings are really strong. So, you know, they're not, it's not, you know, if you have all four, if you only have one, you might break that one off. So you need to be very careful to fold all four of them up together. And binoculars and a camera are great alternatives Absolutely. if you're not comfortable yeah. with that. Mm -hmm. yep. And it, netting is a, is a, is a, an art and a skill. I mean, you have to learn how to do that. And mm -hmm. if you if you're around somebody who really knows how to do it well, it, I mean, they can make it look really stupidly easy. But 
it takes a long time to get there. So you just have to, you know, enjoy the frustration and and yeah. have a sense of humor and realize that you're probably making somebody laugh that's somewhere around you. The common denominator with everyone who nets anything is that you look pretty foolish doing it, <laughs> running around chasing an insect. It's great. Um, do all dragonflies and damselflies migrate, or if not, how do they winter? Dragon, only a small percentage of dragonflies and damselflies migrate. Um, so in Wisconsin, I mentioned that common green darner, that's a, a very well-known long distance migrant. Uh, their migration to Wisconsin is, is, I think it's over 900 miles to get here. Um, there's also, and there's also, a, so that's one darner that does. There are several skimmers. There's a little variegated meadowhawk. It's only about an inch and a quarter long, migrates almost the same distance. Uh, there are two gliders, the wandering glider and the spot wing glider that are big migrants. And if, and the common denominator with most of these, if you look at them, they have proportionally immense wings so that they can fly very effortlessly. Um, the wandering glider has literally been found a thousand miles out, to, out in the ocean. Um, and there's actually one population, they're found all over the Northern hemisphere. And there's actually a population that migrates from India over to Africa, up the African coast to the Middle East and back. So they do a circle and it takes two or three generations to do that, but they literally fly across the Indian Ocean. Oh. So some of them are, you know, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple drag damselflies that also disperse like that. Um, there, there's a little, itty, one of the littlest damselflies we have in the, in the state, the citrine forktail is known to do that. And, and you know, uh, other species, um, extend their range by doing kind of eruptions away from, a, you know, what they don't do a, a, a true migration, but they might move 10, 50 miles to, you know, to disperse, hopefully finding um, new ponds or, or that could support their species in the process. And that's kind of how they expand their range and take advantage of, of new opportunities. And it might be how they survive uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. So for the species that don't migrate, how do they survive winter in a place like Wisconsin? Uh, it depends on the species. Some overwinter as eggs, like I mentioned. So the eggs would might be uh, protected in the, um, you know, in plant material. Uh, a lot of them overwinter as nymphs. Um, I guess I didn't specifically say that, but once they emerge, once the female, once they've mated and the females laid their eggs, they die. So the, act, the, the normal flight, the, the normal lifespan, once they reach the, the flight stage uh, is as little as a couple weeks for some damselflies and maybe as long as four or five months for some tropical dragonflies. But most of them are, are measured in weeks, you know, uh, four or five, six weeks at the most. So once they start flying, they're not gonna be around very long. Once they're done, uh, you know, mating and laying and in the case of the female laying her eggs uh, that you know then, then their job is done there then it's the next generation okay so there are a couple of longer questions that are in the comments that i'll just let you read after we're done oh. here and then maybe you can respond after we're off the off the video but one last question that came in is do you have a recommendation for a camera for photographing damselflies or dragonflies uh, i can tell you what I do. Um, I, I have a Canon EOS 7D. So the EOS series, whether that's a rebel or up, you know, into the semi-professional ranges, um, I, they can range in price from a couple hundred dollars and up, <laughs> way up <laughs> for the body. Um, I happen to use a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Um, I happen, uh, the lens, the lens I have is a Canon, uh, L series lens, and it, it's it's a spectacular lens because it can focus as close as two and a half feet. So, and if you're trying to get a picture of a damselfly, that's really important so that you can get right up close to it. But at the same time, with 400 millimeter, there are some dragonfly species that won't let you get. You know, some of them are start going to start flying when you're 20 feet away. So having that top end of 400 millimeter actually is a is a huge help. Um, Frankly, that's not a cheap setup. Um, so a lot of the, you know, there are a lot of people that are very effective in using, you know, some of the more advanced 
point and shoot cameras that that you know with with higher optical zooms that can zoom in the only problem with those typically is oftentimes there's a delay between the time you push the shutter button and you know when it takes a picture uh, my camera i can shoot eight frames a second so if i'm trying to take a picture of a flying dragonfly that's important um, so you just you kind of have to work within your budget um, i would suggest that used equipment can be a great way um, i bought i updated my body the body of my equipment for only 250 dollars so um, you know that was a camera that new would have been 13 or 1400 so you know if, if, don't be bashful that's a great way to do it and and even the eos rebel line which is kind of the baby sisters of of of, of the semi-pro versions that i'm shooting um, you know nowadays they're so spectacular the capabilities are, are you know out of this world so well great well those are all the questions and I, that is all the time so thank you all for tuning in and um thank you dan for being here we're so grateful for your expertise yeah thank you very much really appreciate it yeah. we'll talk to you soon